Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to another episode of Science and Technology Q&A for kids and others. And I see we have a bunch of questions uh, saved up here. So let's see, where should we go first? Okay, we have a question from William. Uh, why does Occam's razor work? Okay, first question is what is Occam's razor? So it's a kind of principle about theories in science. And it was due to a chap called William of Ockham back hmm, nearly a thousand years ago now, I think. Uh, and when people are trying to explain things in science or maybe elsewhere, it's a question of how elaborate is the explanation supposed to be? Is it, what is more likely, an explanation that's very elaborate or a simple explanation? Let's say, for example, that I'm, um, looking at the uh, screen that I'm looking at right now. And the question is, why does it have, or no, let, let me pick another example. Let's say I observe that uh, a tree is, uh, has a branch that's fallen off it. Okay, and I have a variety of explanations. One of my explanations is there was a beaver and the beaver climbed up the tree and the beaver sawed its way through this branch, meaning to use it for a beaver dam. But then when the branch fell down, the beaver ran away and all I can see is there was a branch on the ground. Or another possible explanation is there was a strong wind and the wind broke the branch and the branch fell on the ground. And there might be a whole bunch of other explanations. And the question is, which explanation is the most likely to be right? Is it the very elaborate explanation or is it the simpler explanation? It's kind of like when you wonder, why did something happen in the world? Was it a giant conspiracy that involved all these different moving parts? Or was it just, oh, somebody made a mistake, and so that's why it happened? So Occam's razor, uh, it's often stated in terms of don't, don't sort of introduce extra ideas when you don't need them to explain what's going on in something. And in science, it's been a very common principle that's applied. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So for instance, in um, uh, let's say in biology, there's the question of sort of why are there, why is there some feature of some animal? And there's the elaborate explanation that has many, many steps. And there's the simple, oh, it, it just grew that way because of some simple thing. You know, what's likely to be the right explanation? And this is a, it's a very interesting question, whether there is a, a principled reason why Occam's razor should work. Sometimes in areas like technology or in human built things, there's sort of a reason why it should work. Let's say, uh, because in a sense, something has been made progressively more streamlined. It's like, like um, there used to be some very elaborate procedure for doing something, and it was obviously more efficient to make the procedure simpler. So eventually the thing became simple. And so it was it, eventually it sort of became streamlined, but became sort of the simplest explanation works. But it, it, this sort of also relates to questions like, if you have a theory that is very elegant, and it just says, you put these few things in and you get all this stuff out. Is that a more likely to be correct theory than a theory where there's a lot of very complicated things that go in to get some particular thing out? Different fields, there are different intuitions that tend to work. For example, in medicine, uh, it's often the case that things are just very, very complicated in explaining what's going on in medicine. Um, sometimes I, I um, uh, I think it, it's sort of the, that the, even when you think you understand what's going on, there's even some other effect and some other thing that's complicated that, that can be important. Now, the, the, the experience in physics has tended to be that the simplest theory is most likely to be right. Um, it uh, sometimes doesn't quite work that way. For example, in the standard model of particle physics, there's some sort of extra little pieces that are kind of weird and the world wouldn't be the way it is 
so far as we know, apart from those extra pieces, but there are like, why do these exist? Why are they these extra pieces? For example, famous example. So people know about electrons. There are two other types of particles that are very similar to electrons. Things called muons, things called tau leptons. Nobody knows why those things exist. They're just things that happen to exist in physics. And they're sort of not physics, you might think could have been simpler if those didn't exist. Now, hopefully before too long, we'll understand why those exist and why it's inevitable that from a perhaps very simple underlying structure of physics, those have to exist. But as of right now, it just looks like those are extra little twiddles that don't really need to exist to, uh, to make physics work. But I think, um, I mean, the question of, of when do simpler explanations, when are simpler explanations the right thing is, is, is uh, there's another issue that comes up with those. Um, let's say that you have some data. Let's say you plot it on a graph, there's a bunch of points. And you say, what is the model that describes these points? Well, one thing you can do is say, oh, let's just put a straight line through these points. It doesn't go exactly through the points, but it's more or less aligned with the points. Okay, there's our model. Another possibility is you can have not a straight line, but some very wiggly line that exactly goes through every single point. And you say, which is the better model? The thing with very few, very small number of parameters, the very the model that's very easy to state, you could sort of say it in a sentence, it's just like the, the this thing is proportional to 2.7 times that thing, it's a straight line. Or the thing that requires a big long explanation about how, oh, it's this complicated mathematical function, it wiggles up and down, but it gets every single data point. Which is the better model? So that turns out to be a, a not such a simple question, there's sort of a trade-off. You can be fit the data more accurately, or you can have a simpler model. How do you trade off those two things? In a sense, you need some sort of measure of how complicated is your model, and then you need some criterion to say how you trade off complexity of model for, uh, for how well it fits the specific data you have. And so, particularly in modern machine learning, there are a bunch of somewhat streamlined criteria that are used to decide this question of have you overfit the data? Have you had a model that, yes, it fits the data really well, but it's a goofy model because it's an incredibly overcomplicated model um, or not? And, and sometimes also there's a question of what does it even mean to have a good model? Is it a model that, um, um, uh, that has some, um, um, uh, what, what is the model that you're making something that is supposed to be a real representation of the mechanism that underlies how the thing works? Or is it merely something that explains what's going to happen and just gives you a criterion for explaining what's gonna happen? So for example, there are, uh, it, particularly with modern machine learning, you can say, here are a bunch of examples of what happens. Okay, give me a black box that will tell me how another example is going to work out. You've got something that does can do a pretty good job of that. But if you say, well, what, what is the mechanism by which this thing happens? Well, uh, that may be extremely difficult to know. It may just seem like this is a thing, it fits the data. It gives me an answer that fits the data, but we don't know the mechanism. And then the other possibility is, oh, you've got some model where you can look inside and see the mechanism. And it's sort of interesting in different fields, people sort of expect different levels of sort of mechanistic explanation. I think, uh, well, for example, in medicine, there are a bunch of famous formulas that are widely used in medicine that if you tried to say, what's their mechanism? It's like, it's completely crazy. It doesn't make any sense. But yet as empirical formulas, they work quite well. A famous one is the body surface area formula, which is often used for various kinds of drug dosing. And um, it's, uh, it says, you know, the amount of, of a drug you should give people should be proportional to this quantity that is sort of the surface area of their, you know, of, of, uh, of their bodies as opposed to the volume. Um, but the formula for surface area is something completely crazy. Those units don't even match. I mean, it depends on height and various other things. Um, and, uh, but yet it is empirically used and, and quite successful uh, for lots of purposes. So, this, this question of sort of what's inside the model and is there a mechanistic thing that's going on versus is it just a model where you plug numbers in and it works is, is an interesting question. 
And in this kind of back to the original sort of Occam's razor question, the question of uh, if you have these different theories, you might have a trade-off between a theory that fits the data you have really well, um, but it's a very, very complicated theory versus a theory where the theory is simple, but doesn't fit the data quite so well. I think at the time of William of Ockham, uh, he was really sort of arguing against just incredibly bizarre to us today, sort of pre-scientific theories of how things worked um, and arguing for something where there were simpler mechanistic explanations of things. And as I say, sometimes simple works, there are other times where it doesn't work so well. Um, and uh, uh, it's, it is a, it's, a, it's a curious thing to know when simplicity is rewarded. So for instance, there are cases I mentioned in technology, there are also cases in places like biology where an incredibly elaborate way to make something is probably gonna have more ways to fail and probably isn't going to be the way the thing gets made. Um, it probably, the, probably the, the sort of the process of making things will sort of gradually uh, sort of squash out the inefficiencies. You know, if you say, uh, how does a particular form in biology get made? Um, uh, the explanation, oh, it folds in this way and then it twists in this way and then it does that and then it does this and then it does that and, and so on. And there's a step, 25 steps, that's less likely to be correct than something that involves fewer steps. But just in the sort of confusion of biology, there are plenty of things that work in surprisingly complicated ways um, that do involve a surprising number of steps to, to achieve, to, to get to the point that, that we actually observe. Let's see. And questions here, oh boy. Um, <laughs> there's a question from a Tory asking me, uh, do I know how to cook? I'm afraid that's one of the domains of human knowledge in which I am deeply deficient. Uh, no, I am, I'm absolutely pathetic in that, in that domain. Um, it's, uh, uh, somehow there's a certain, um, uh, intuition about sort of creating, uh, things that I suppose is sort of chemical synthesis, uh, creating food, all those kinds of things. But um, uh, I've, I've not been a, a personal, not personally partaken in those things in any, in any appropriate way. Uh, I think the thing that's always surprising at a sort of meta scientific level about food is, isn't it remarkable that you can just eat all this random stuff and it somehow can turn into growing pieces of you, even though you are, you know, made of things that seem very different from the things you eat. And in a sense, that's, that's one of the sort of universal features of life uh, on earth, at least, is the fact that it's all made from these components like proteins and proteins are made from this limited number of amino acids. You know, every protein is just a chain of, of some sequence of these about 20 um, different possible amino acids. And when we eat food, we're getting all the food we're eating, plant food, uh, animal food, et cetera, is all contains proteins, a little bit different between plants and animals. Um, that's why people who, who, who choose to not eat any kind of meat have to supplement their diets with, with things that have some of those extra amino acids, which just aren't made by plants. But nevertheless, it's, um, it's something where uh, it's sort of remarkable that there's enough universality in the kinds of things that, uh, that we eat, that it's possible to sort of eat almost anything and end up being able to use that to make pieces of yourself, so to speak. It's also sort of remarkable that if you look at not just amino acids and proteins, but also just random things like, you know, magnesium or potassium or whatever else, that sort of there's enough kind of mixing of stuff that and there's a small enough number of different chemical elements that are important to life that we sort of seem to manage to get kind of enough of all of these things um, in a uh, from just random stuff that we eat. We don't have to say, oh, I'm going to very carefully eat this or that thing because I'm specifically trying to, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have to eat bone in order to make bone, so to speak. I can sort of eat almost anything that is part of this kind of collection of kind of life 
made and life making uh, kinds of things and, and that sort of works. Now, I mean, there's, there's also the question of, well, okay, you can get away with eating all these different things. Uh, you know, what do you like to eat, so to speak? And, and that gets one into the whole elaborate, complicated theory of how things like taste and so on work. And, uh, and the great importance that the sort of physical uh, characteristics of food have on how they taste. I mean, it's always remarkable to me that, you know, a thing that, you know, you slice something up and it will taste different than if you just, you know, bite into it, so to speak. Um, it really matters what the sort of physical surface of food is to how it's how you perceive it. And, and that's not totally surprising because the way that you're perceiving the taste of food is that, you know, the food on your tongue is actually physically interacting with the taste buds that are on your tongue. So if you, you know, if you slice that banana up, the, the, the sliced surface of the banana may have a different essentially chemical interaction with the taste buds on your tongue than the, than the sort of whole mashed up banana mashed up with your teeth, so to speak. So, I mean, there are, it's, it's, it's sort of interesting to see, and there's, there's still a, a, a not far from complete understanding of sort of gastronomy at the, at the molecular level, so to speak. And, and at what sort of at, at what kinds of things you might combine. I mean, it's also interesting when you when you see, you know, at some fancy restaurant, you'll see some some bizarre, unusual combination of this with that. And it's like, how do you know that's going to work? Um, and uh, there isn't, uh, I think, yet a, a, a good kind of uh, physics style theory of sort of how you combine different kinds of things in um, in the gastronomical universe, so to speak, uh, to be able to make things that, um, uh, that work. I mean, and, and sometimes things, I, I don't know, I, I, I think a very American thing is, you know, peanut butter and jelly or something, which is something I don't think I've, I've ever had it actually. And it sounds horrible to me, but, but it's something where, gosh, it actually works. And um, uh, um, the, uh, I think um, these are things where sort of interesting how those combinations can be made. Um, in any case, the, the, uh, the, but the, the answer to the original question is no, I'm, I'm, I'm pathetically ignorant of, of cooking things. Um, the, uh, so let's see, there's a question here. How, from Amrit, how would you explain your, the goal of your physics project uh, to a five-year-old? Hmm, five's a little young. Five's a little young. I think one would start off by saying, you pick up a thing, an object. What's it made of? If you were to have, if you were to look at smaller and smaller and smaller scale, what's this thing made of? And you might say, well, turns out this thing is made of little things called atoms and they're very small. And then you say, well, what's, what's everything else made of? Like what's, if, if we just have empty space, and of course that's not a thing that, that, one, that one people intrinsically understand, you know, there's air, but the idea of vacuum where there's the fact, the fact that there's something in the air is, is, is its own separate concept. And the fact that there's a vacuum where there's sort of nothing there is, 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 is yet, a, yet a separate concept, but it's kind of the, um, uh, the the thing of of what um, uh, how does how does um, uh, what what is the universe sort of fundamentally made of um, is is something that um, um, one uh, one's going for there. I'm not sure. I think five is a little young to explain that with with serious clarity. I think that um, um, you might also say. Uh, well, okay, here's another approach. Uh, if you know about video games, which your average modern five-year-old is going to know something about, um, the question is, could you make a video game that is just like the whole world, that's just got everything that we know about in the world in the video game? Could somebody program a video game to just be like the world? And, and do we know how to do that? Do we know how to make a thing that will be just like the world and, and is what's underneath it something that uh, you know you could run on your phone or your computer or whatever else. 
I mean, I think that's another, another possible way into it. And then to be able to ask, well, if we could do that, can we figure out kind of what moves are possible in the actual universe by doing that? Just like somebody programmed that video game that you're using and the, you know, the character you have in the video game can make various moves, but the person who programmed it kind of decided those moves to make. Um, and the question is, if we were able to sort of make a program for the universe, could we then figure out what all things are possible in, in the universe? You know, I have to say that, that this whole question of kind of what is the world made out of is, is a question that has been of sort of philosophical interest for, well, throughout the sort of history of recorded philosophy. I'm not sure how often it's been of deeply practical uh, sort of central interest. I think it's more one of those kinds of things that it's sort of the ultimate foundation for understanding how you build up science, but it's not obvious that it's kind of the, the everyday here and now question that people need to ask, just as when you study biology or medicine, uh, yes, it's nice to know something about the origin of life and the fundamental things that make life, life versus non-life, but it's not the everyday question that you have to ask in doing biology or medicine or something like that. So, Oh, there's a question here about um, from Fr Frederick about um, pandemics and crises and so on, and that perhaps the next one will be an attack on the internet. What do you think? Look, I think one of the things that um, uh, is always a question for uh, us, our species, is you know what are the existential threats to our species? What, you know, if we look at the fossil record of, of life on Earth, goes back close to three billion years, we can see that there were species that lasted for a while. Sometimes they were really successful. They lasted for hundreds of millions of years, and then they went extinct. And the, sort of the question of, is that a necessary feature of how biology works? That species come up, uh, things, things are figured out for a while, dinosaurs do really well for a while, trilobites do really well for a while, and then uh, you know all good things come to an end, so to speak. And then uh, the, the 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 fossil record shows that species dies out. Is that something that's somehow inevitable, or is it the case that oh uh, something goofy happened, an asteroid hit the Earth, whatever? That's why the dinosaurs died out. It didn't really need to happen that way, so to speak. I don't think we really know the answer to that, but I think it's an interesting question. What uh, sort of what sort of existential threats, which which might like, you know, make our species go extinct, might exist? I mean, there are certainly things that um, uh, you know could happen that are really bad. There are things that we kind of know from science aren't going to happen. The sun is not going to explode as a supernova. It doesn't happen to stars the size of the sun. Could there be a supernova nearby? Yeah, there could be. It would cause trouble for us. Is it likely? It's extremely unlikely. Um, it's uh, uh, you know, in, in by nearby, I mean in a star within 10 light years, 20 light years, something like that. Um, I think there are, I'm not sure at what point there are stars that, that could have a supernova explosion. Exactly what effects it would have on Earth, I don't think completely known. Um, but, you know, it's an example of something can happen. Uh, you know, could a giant asteroid crash into the Earth? Yeah, it could happen. Has happened a few times in the last few billion years, but isn't very common. Um, could there be, you know, when I was a kid, the, the most obvious existential threat was, you know, people start using all those nuclear weapons they've accumulated. And uh, then the question is, what happens if you detonate a thousand nuclear explosions um, on the earth? What happens to the earth? And uh, a popular idea was this idea of so-called nuclear winter. So the popular idea was, and it's kind of an echo of, of uh, sort of climate change kinds of questions, but um, the observation, the idea was uh, the earth, you know, is the temperature it is because it gets uh, heat from the sun and so on, gets radiation, so solar radiation and all that kind of thing. But if you detonate a bunch of nuclear explosions in, on the earth, you throw up a bunch of dust and the dust ends up in the upper atmosphere and the dust ends up blocking sunlight for at least a few years. And uh, 
the world ends up being very cold. And that, that happened presumably when the, uh, at, the, at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary 65 million years ago, um, when that uh, uh, asteroid hit the earth um, that uh, caused trouble for the dinosaurs, um, one of the things that happened is it was probably pretty cold for a couple of years as this dust got thrown into the upper atmosphere. And the, the same thing happened, for example, when Krakatoa uh, volcano in Indonesia exploded in the late 1800s, um, was a dramatic explosion. It threw dust into the upper atmosphere and it, it cooled the surface of the earth down by a certain amount. Um, obviously in, in today's world, despite, uh, you know, it would be, it would be, uh, we'd be, all be a bit frustrated if the earth was, was cold and dark for a couple of years, but in most places, um, it wouldn't uh, wipe out the species. I mean, the, the dinosaurs probably, uh, we assume, didn't know how to make fires and things like that. Um, I, I don't know if we know for absolutely certain that dinosaurs couldn't make fire, but presumably they couldn't. Um, the, uh, uh, and so, you know, that wasn't an option, so to speak, to keep warm during that period of time. But, you know, if you ask what other things what other really bad things could happen? I mean, it always, pandemic has always been on the list of, of things that could happen. And there's sort of a, a, a features of pandemics as you sort of change the, the dial of what was actually going on. Like for example, you can have a virus that is incredibly fatal to people. And you know, you catch the virus and it, 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 uh, it with high probability kills you. But, but the thing about a virus like that is it's, it's hard for that virus to get transmitted because viruses get transmitted by somebody has the virus and then they are sort of breathing out the virus or, or whatever else and, and they're walking around with the virus and then they can give it to other people. The virus has a host that allows it to kind of jump to the next person and so on. If the virus has killed the person, then they're not out and about and spreading the virus to other people. So for viruses, there's a sort of complicated uh, natural selection process that will make things not be, uh, it tends to not be good for spreading of a virus to have it be uh, too fatal to its host. Sort of the best thing for probably for a virus is, you know, it doesn't really do the virus any good to have the host be uh, off on their own, so to speak, you know, off in bed for, for a week. It's better for the virus to have very little effect on the host. So the host is out and about spreading the virus. I mean, one sees similar strategies in uh, lots of kinds of plants that need to uh, spread their seeds and they want animals to spread their seeds and they want the animals to be out and about and, and doing that. And the last thing they want is to you know, hurt the animal and have it not be able to walk around and spread the seeds. So, but um, uh, you know, there, are, there are other potential uh, sort of things that, um, there are plenty of things that can go wrong. And uh, the question of sort of things going wrong with the internet is an interesting one. And um, the, uh, um, you know, there are, so, so to explain a little bit about uh, viruses and worms and in general malware on the internet, let's talk a little bit about that. So the, um, the basic, well, let's see. The very first worm, I remember when that was created and, and know some of the people involved, um, the, uh, the first internet worm, it's, here's, here's what it did. It did a very weird thing. It was a piece of a program running on a computer and its goal was much like a living organism to get copies of itself made on lots and lots of other computers. And so it was doing the sort of self-reproduction thing that we expect living systems to do, but it was doing it on a computer. So it was a program running on a computer and the program would basically use the internet to, uh, it, would, it, would be, it would contact other computers or other computers would contact a particular computer and they would, that, that program would get transferred through the internet to that other computer and then it would start running on the other computer. And then it would start trying to make copies of itself be running on yet more computers. And after, if it starts off on one computer and then it goes to five computers and then each of those five computers spreads it to five more computers, pretty soon you spread it to an awful lot of computers, at least to computers that are connected to the internet. And 
it it um, uh, typically well, it's it's always a complicated thing because when you are trying to you go to a website and the website says there are just amazing cool things you can do just download this piece of software and it will do amazing cool things for you so the concern is that it could be the case that that piece of software is absolutely uh, just going to do those amazing cool things and that's all it's going to do could also be that you download that piece of software and it's actually going to do bad things as well for example it's going to do that thing that the early worm did and say, yeah, great, I'm now running in your computer. Let me see if I can get other people to download me and then I'll be able to make copies of myself and be able to run on lots of other computers as well. And that, that's why, for example, one of the things that's important in, in the modern world is that things that get that where you say there's this piece of software and you're, you're being told download this piece of software and run it. It's important that the the thing that that software is, is signed somehow. It has some kind of digital signature that says, yes, this came from the place you thought it came from, and you can decide, are you going to trust this particular company or whatever? But the first thing is to confirm that the thing you got actually came from the thing you thought it came from. And there's a whole mechanism of sort of how you make these trust networks to decide, yes, the thing I got has this digital signature. How do I trust that digital signature? I have to have some kind of certificate authority that is the thing that tells me that I should trust this digital signature and that it really came from that place. But the, the, there, are, there are always ways that things get, um, uh, the, the things like that get avoided and, and places and bugs in operating systems and so on that allow uh, pieces of software that are essentially self-reproducing software to be spread from computer to computer. And that's the most common scenario for, uh, for one to get kind of a, a, a large scale spreading of, um, uh, of, 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 of malware, of, of bad software, so to speak. Uh, it's a complicated thing because in modern warfare, it's pretty important to have um, the, uh, uh, to be able to sort of attack the computers of your enemy. And there have been a number of times in, in sort of uh, fairly recent history where things like that have been done. I mean, the famous examples in um, uh, Estonia, then in Georgia, um, where, well, those were, uh, the, the Estonia case was a, was a slightly different one. That was one where, oh, it's sort of argued whether that was a, a Russian government thing or whether it was a, the Russian government just asked people to go visit the Estonian government websites all at the same time. And that caused those websites to get overloaded and to, and to go down. Um, but then, you know, there are other cases where it's like, okay, you're going to go attack somewhere. And um, uh, the, you know, if, if you want to do that, it's kind of a modern version of, uh, you know, if you're going to wage a war, you know, do you have control of the skies? Do you have control of, of this or that uh, uh, thing? And having sort of control of cyberspace is, is something that's going to be, it's already important and it's going to be even more important. Um, and there are cases where, uh, where that's, that's been done. And the, the way that it tends to work is there's, well, how do you build these pieces of malware? Mostly, you need to find bugs in operating systems or bugs in programs and application programs that will allow you to somehow uh, use those bugs to take over computers. And um, I mean, one thing worth understanding is why should it be the case that, for example, you could take something like a, a random webcam on a, on a door or something and be able to take it, take it over? Why should it be built so that it's possible to take it over. You know, doesn't that seem like a goofy thing to do? Why isn't it just being a, uh, you know, a, a, an electronic doorbell and nothing else? Why isn't it just being a, a, uh, an, a network router and nothing else? The reason that it tends to be something else is sort of the fundamental reason that software works so well to begin with, which is these things tend to be set up to be universal computers. They, they tend to be set up to be things that, yes, you thought it was just a router, but in fact, 
the router needs to be able to use some sophisticated algorithm to decide whether it should send traffic here or there. And in order to do that, by far the most efficient way to do that is to have it be operating on a universal computer that could be programmed to do anything. So it can be programmed to run this particular sophisticated adaptive algorithm, or it could be programmed to do something else or whatever else. So it tends to be the case that sort of in almost all programs end up being essentially like universal computers. Within that program, you can program anything. And it tends to be that way just because that's the way you get programs to be, to be smart and sophisticated and to have lots of potential capabilities. But that feature is also the weakness of, of sort of lots and lots of the software infrastructure of the world, because it means that the, these, these systems in principle have the capability to do anything. And so if you can only kind of worm your way into that capability, you can make them do anything, including bad things that they really weren't intended to do. So a big part of kind of sort of the breaking into computer systems consists of finding some way you go from stepping stone to stepping stone and find some way to get to the point where you can make you can program the system to do anything. Once you can program the system to do anything, you're in and you can you can set it up to do whatever uh, sort of bad things you, you wanted to do and so on. But so the way it tends to work is there's sort of a uh, people trying to find those kinds of vulnerabilities, those kinds of places where you can sort of get your way into computer systems. And there's a, a, a sort of a strange world of people um, uh, doing that type of thing. The, the sort of the most valuable thing to have is what gets called a zero day exploit, which means I found a problem. I found a bug in such and such an operating system. I found a way to sort of do this or that weird thing and to break into that operating system. I found this way to do it, and I know it, but nobody else does. And so on day zero, if, if people start using it, nobody knows that vulnerability. Nobody knows how to patch the operating system, how to get around it. It's like a thing that is a fresh possibility that there won't be a countermeasure for. So sort of the most valuable thing is a zero day exploit that nobody has discovered before. And, and so there's a whole strange arms trade of, uh, of people uh, creating and selling zero day exploits. And there's sort of a, uh, you know, governments hoarding these kinds of things and waiting for the moment when they can potentially be used to attack an adversary. So that's, uh, that's the kind of thing that, that can happen. Now, you know, there have been uh, some definite high nuisance value um, kinds of uh, attacks on the internet. There hasn't been a case where sort of the whole internet has been brought down um, by, um, uh, by this. So the very first, um, when was the, uh, the Morris worm? Maybe 1991, hmm, maybe 1990, something like that. The very first of these, um, of these, uh, of these things uh, had a pretty big effect on the internet. It was pretty much most computer systems, most companies, um, the thing had sort of reproduced itself into their computers and it had kept on reproducing, reproducing, reproducing. And it had meant that the most of the computer time that was being spent was just running the code of this worm and not doing whatever the computers were supposed to do. I have to say, I felt very pleased with myself at the time because our company was not affected by that worm uh, for a strange reason, which was not completely unanticipated. Um, when one connected one's company, one well, connected to the internet, uh, there was a gateway computer that one used. And one of the things that, that I decided for our company was, because uh, I kind of was somewhat aware of these computer security issues, it was like, let's use the weirdest computer we have to be the gateway computer. And we used some strange Japanese workstation that was commercially not successful at all, but we had uh, 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 ported our software to that computer. So we had, we had one of these computers and we used that as our gateway computer. Why was that a good thing? It was a good thing because the way the worm had to work, it had to be set up to have a version that ran on each kind of computer that it would visit. It was kind of like if you were a, a virus, like a biological virus, uh, there's sort of 
if you want it to be a multi-species virus, like I can affect humans, I can affect uh, you know, uh, wild turkeys, I can affect cats, I can affect dogs, you probably need variants of the virus to infect each of those different species. And so similarly with computer viruses, you needed to take the underlying code of the virus or the worm and, and recompile it, uh, just rebuild the code for each different kind of computer. And nobody had bothered to build, the people who created this, this worm hadn't created a version for this totally weird computer. So it couldn't affect us. And, uh, and so we were, not, we were not affected by that. But the question of, could the whole internet be kind of taken down by some uh, sort of uh, uh, kind of um, uh, computer virus malware type thing? Probably the answer is yes. Um, the internet is set up to be quite resilient to those kinds of things. It was, it was built originally as, as kind of a, a, a sort of military inspired project. And it was built with the intention of having a lot of redundancy so that, so that there are many connections from one place to another, many different routes that packets can take to go from one place to another. And even if you uh, sort of say everything in city X is taken out, it's still the case that data can get by going through city Y can get to its destination. So it's, it's intended to be very resilient like that. However, uh, there are still is plenty of places where the internet is using uh, software systems that um, route traffic, route internet data from one place to another and so on. And I'm quite certain that there's a way that it's conceivable that um, some piece of sort of bad software could spread through all of those places that are routing traffic to the internet and take the whole thing down. Now, people try to avoid certain systems being taken down. The, the typical term for this is air gapping um, a system, which means basically there's a place where you just can't get data to a particular system. There's an air gap. There's just, there's no wire that connects the system to the other. Now you say there's no wire. Well, of course there's wireless transmission of things. And so you have to worry about that. And in the most secure kinds of computer installations, people do things like put computers inside uh, copper boxes where you can, you can use that copper box to stop any kind of radio signal from getting in. Um, and that's kind of, or getting out for that matter. And that's kind of the, the most uh, secure way to do things. But of course, it's rather inconvenient to have your computer inside a, a copper box and it's also quite inconvenient and increasingly so in the modern world to have your computer disconnected from the internet. So there's a, a, and there's a great tendency to connect just because, oh, it might be convenient to do that, to connect all imaginable computers, all imaginable computer-like things to the internet because, well, why not, so to speak? Well, of course, that has the effect that um, uh, if somebody is trying to attack the computer, there is a path to get into the computer. I mean, for example, I remember an exploit done by somebody I, I knew actually, um, that was uh, something where it's like, can you get, this was at a government lab where there were sort of secret computers and there were non-secret computers. Could you get to the secret computers from the non-secret computers? How would you do that? Well, he noticed that there was a printer that could be accessed in days when printers were expensive things, there was a printer that could be accessed both from the secure secret computers and from the non-secure non-secret computers. And so the question was, well, the printer is supposed to be something where you just print to it. Nothing comes back from the printer, but oh well, this printer was just a little bit too clever. So in fact, there were things that when, a, when for example, when the printer got jammed, the printer would send a message back saying, I'm a jammed printer and it would send it back to a computer. And so it wasn't the case that it was, while you might've thought, oh, it's just a one-way transmission of information, it wasn't. And so it was possible by, by sort of little sort of clever steps to send data in from the non-secure side into the printer, the printer, oh, it's just supposed to be a printer, but actually it was sending data back out and it sent data back out to the secure side. And then that data caused a computer there to send data back in and so pretty soon it had established a communication channel through this printer. 
which is something you're not supposed to, you might not think you were able to communicate through. But that's a typical example of how it's like, well, why not give it these capabilities? And then the question of how do you guarantee that those capabilities can't allow the wrong things to happen, that's a very challenging thing. People, people sometimes imagine that you will be able to make like a mathematical theorem that says nothing bad could possibly happen with this particular piece of software. The problem with that is that the, the, the way these things work, if you can prove a mathematical theorem like that, it pretty much tells you that your software can't do sophisticated things. As soon as the software is capable of doing sophisticated things, it becomes impossible to sort of prove slam dunk, complete mathematical theorem type results about what the software does. And so that's sort of an, another challenging uh, sort of trade-off is you can either have the software do sophisticated things or you can have it be very secure and be sure that you know what it's doing and that it's not doing anything bad. I mean, it's, it's a little bit similar to the trade-off that happens a lot with how complicated do you want your whole password mechanism to be? You know, do you want to use some uh, two-factor authentication where the thing is texting you a message on your phone and doing this and doing that? Oh, well, I don't want to do that. It's just too much of a nuisance. Um, well, you know, that's a, that's a trade-off. It's more secure if you do those things. It's more difficult for somebody to just uh, you know, steal your password and break into your account. On the other hand, every single time you log in, it's going to take you longer because you have to go through all these different steps. So that's a sort of a simple version of that, of the general trade-off. But um, yeah, so I, I think in terms of the sort of what would happen if, uh, is it possible for the whole internet to be taken down? Uh, my guess is the answer is yes. Um, is it obvious how to do it? Not really. I mean, there are things that could happen that are very, very bizarre. Like for example, one thing that could happen is, uh, which people worry about, is um, uh, what has been seen mostly in the past is software type attacks on computers. You, you, you send a piece of bad software into a computer, it starts running on the computer, it does things it wasn't supposed to do. Now, sometimes those effects, those sort of uh, bad software effects can have an effect in the real physical world. So a very famous example of this historical example was the um, attack on the Iranian uh, um, uh, uranium, uh, uh, Iranian, uh, uranium uh, centrifuges that were uh, being used to separate uranium-235 from uranium-238. And they involve spinning very rapidly this uh, uranium gas. And um, the, uh, uh, this attack that was done um, on them uh, attacked the control software that was responsible for spinning all these centrifuges. And um, it caused the control software to make them spin very, very fast, much faster than they should have been spinning, and eventually to self-destruct. And um, so that was something which was achieved by essentially a pure software attack. It was just changing the control system to not work the way it was supposed to work and to give indications that said, oh yeah, I'm working just fine, when in fact it wasn't. Um, that was a military attack um, uh, in sort of a cyberspace military attack. Um, and I think the, um, uh, but that's a case where it sort of crossed over from being an attack in, 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 in software to being a physical attack. Now, you know, people worry about the same kinds of things for planes and cars and medical devices and so on. Can you, uh, can you basically from sort of pure software get out into the physical world? But another direction is from something more like the physical world, can you get to the software world? And so one of the issues is when you have a microprocessor or some other kind of chip that might exist, let's say in the routing uh, systems of the internet, um, is it the case that in the, in the billion transistors that are on that chip, and they're all doing different things and they're all setting up all of the, the, the sort of the, the, uh, the computing capabilities of that microprocessor, are they all doing what you think they're doing? And, or are there, is there essentially a hardware virus that somewhere in all those billion transistors, there are things that are like, if, if only the particular right collection of bits is seen in this particular register, the suddenly the thing will uh, make itself switch off or, or, or do something crazy. And 
Nobody really knows. It's a hard thing to determine because it, it's one of these things where you say, there's a billion transistors here. What could they possibly do? It's like saying there's this, this program and it's millions of lines long. What could it possibly do? But it's something where, um, again, it's, it's sort of a potential crossover from the kind of um, the pure, the hardware world to the software world. And nobody knows whether, you know, some, uh, some uh, sort of terrible thing has been done where lots of the, you know, the routing uh, systems of, of the world of the internet have some hardware virus in them where if just exactly the right sequence of, you know, hundreds of bits is sent into all these routers, suddenly they all, uh, you know, they all overheat and, and uh, blow up in puffs of green smoke or, or do something else. Um, it's, it's something very hard to, to determine. Um, and uh, hopefully that hasn't been done, but, but one, it's hard to know. But so that's an example of a type of thing that could happen. Now, now the other thing that could happen, uh, another question is, you know, one thing is that was intentionally done for some military purpose or otherwise. Another possibility is somehow this happened by mistake. Um, you know, could there be the bug that takes down the internet by mistake? Um, or could there be even something where one imagined that one was making this AI system that was going to somehow make the world a better place, but actually the AI system ended up uh, causing everything to, to fail in some very ugly way. Certainly that could happen. I mean, we already can see one little sideshow of that um, in, uh, uh, in the internet in general, which is uh, lots of systems, lots of uh, uh, places where, you know, the news feeds of social media and so on um, are, are, you know, effectively the, what you see in your news feed is being selected by an AI. What you see in search results is sort of being selected by an AI. And those AIs are originally given certain motivations like, you know, increase the ad revenue based on, you know, the results and what's coming up and what kinds of ads can be shown and who's going to look at these ads and all those kinds of things. And, but in the end, that, that ranking is, is pretty much picked by an AI in a first approximation. There are sort of human tweaks for better or worse, I think often worse, that are made to those rankings. But, um, but fundamentally, it's, it's some kind of AI that's picking those things and an AI that was originally programmed for some particular purpose. Now, you know, what if the AI does the wrong thing? What if the best way to get people to look at those news feeds is to have incredibly shocking news that uh, appeals to one set of people and horrifies another set of people? And what if you do that across different groups of people and have the result that those groups of people all think completely different things about what's going on in the world because they saw completely different news feeds. Well, you know, to some extent that's happening and that's kind of a sign of, of sort of the unintentional consequences of the AI doing what it was underlying supposed to do. And so that, that's a thing where, where one can kind of um, uh, see sort of the unintentional uh, consequence of, of that. I mean, I, I'll tell... Uh, with respect to the internet, there are things that could happen. For example, the, all the sort of cleverness of knowing, oh, you route messages on the internet in this particular uh, uh, sequence of machines in order to make them arrive faster. Things could go horribly wrong with that. In the early days of the internet, when it was still the ARPANET, things did go wrong with that. I remember a time when um, uh, there was a question of, you know, where should this data be routed through? So it goes through this computer, this computer, this computer. And in those days, the, the protocol for the internet had computers sort of reporting how much time did it take to go through this particular relay computer. And there was a particular computer in Hawaii that for some reason, something had gone wrong with it. And it kept on reporting. It took a negative amount of time to go through me. So that meant if you said, well, what's the total time it was going to take to get a message from here to there? It's like, well, if you send it through Hawaii, it will take less time because it takes a negative time to go through the computer in Hawaii. So needless to say, lots and lots of messages got routed through this computer in Hawaii and the computer in Hawaii completely overloaded. And, um, but, and, and so the internet kind of slowed to a crawl as a result of, of that kind of error in the routing messages. Could that happen again? Well, it's still the case that the actual technology that's used to figure out the routing of messages is a little bit hokey. 
and a little bit weird, um, but you know, there's probably enough diversity in that, that particular kind of thing couldn't really happen. Um, but you know, could something along those lines potentially happen? Maybe. People talked about for a while, it, it's not a popular thing anymore, they talked about internet storms. And the idea was kind of like the, the weather, you know, things are happening in the in the sort of the flow of messages around the internet. It's kind of like the flow of air and circulation in the Earth's atmosphere. And it's like funny things could happen. There could be an internet storm that would cause, you know, this particular set of machines to get very busy and, and things to, you know, it's like a, a hurricane on the internet. Uh, people don't talk about that much these days. Um, I think that really didn't happen as much as people thought it might. Um, and I think, uh, uh, but but you know, those are those are those are some possibilities. Let's see. Um, okay, there's Tarka is saying the first virus apparently was a creeper system, as an experimental self-replicating virus in 1971. Okay, I didn't know that. Um, the uh, let's see. Oh boy, so many questions here. It's a question. Um, I could just do a, a few more here. Sorry, I've 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 spent a long time describing these. Um, uh, recent answers, let's see. Um, um, there's a question here about, um, yeah, from Dine Bayer. Uh, what do I think about the strange shaped asteroid that passed through the solar system and to cause speculation that it was an interstellar voyager? Uh, that was this thing called Uma Numa, I guess, which was, what was it, a year and a half ago, maybe? Um, it was a, a strange sort of cigar-shaped thing. And um, the, uh, uh, the question, and it was observed, kind of, there are many asteroids, millions of asteroids that um, uh, orbit mostly between the orbits of Mars and, and Jupiter, um, but they occasionally uh, go outside of that zone and um, occasionally they get close to the Earth and uh, um, they go in other places. But for any asteroid, you can kind of track, oh, the asteroid is orbiting around the sun and it's going at a certain speed. And you can see, oh, there's an effect from Jupiter and it's pulling the asteroid this way and so on and so on and so on. But this particular asteroid was weird because it was going at a speed that was such that it was not in orbit around the sun. It was clearly not going to orbit the sun. It was clearly something which hadn't been orbiting the sun and it wasn't going to orbit the sun. It was something that was just passing through our solar system coming from somewhere else. And so that, that there was the first time something like that had been observed. The guess is that there are actually quite a lot of these asteroids or something like that, that come from other solar systems. Um, and uh, for one reason or another, they were ejected from those solar systems I don't know the rate at which asteroids are being ejected from our solar system. It certainly will happen. A typical way it happens is the following. When, when you have, uh, so, so gravity uh, makes uh, massive bodies are attracted to each other. The attraction is proportional to one over the square of the distance between the bodies. So when the bodies are far apart, that means the, the force due to gravity is quite small. But when the bodies are close together, the force gets larger and larger. And when the bodies come really close, the force gets really quite large. So for example, spacecraft regularly that are visiting the outer planets regularly use that. They do a kind of slingshot around Jupiter. They go very close to Jupiter and they use the fact that there's a lot of um, effect from gravity as they swing around Jupiter to make them speed up as they swing around Jupiter and sort of eject them out to the outer solar system. So that's a sort of a common way that things can sort of gain speed as a result of gravity. They get very close to some other massive object and they don't quite hit it, they just go around it. And they're, they're, that as they sort of do that, that partial orbit around it, they, they, um, they're accelerating as they go towards that object and that acceleration ends up causing them to ha have a high speed that will cause them to sort of eject out to somewhere else. And so that, um, 
uh, that process is one that potentially can eject things from the solar system. And um, other things like things crashing into each other and having fragments that get ejected, that's another process and so on. But so this particular thing, this Umanuma thing, um, the, uh, was probably ejected that way from another solar system. Um, it was a bit weird looking. It was a kind of a long cigar shaped thing. It was kind of a reddish color. And it was sort of a question, what if it was a spacecraft? What if it wasn't just a rock? What if it was, uh, uh, you know, maybe it was in, it, you know, it had been traveling through the, um, uh, the galaxy for a billion years. And it was some kind of uh, tourist spacecraft from uh, another civilization. How could you tell? And people were also saying, oh, but it has some, some emissions that it's making, some sort of gas that's coming off it. Of course, it might have just had that because it was being heated up by being close to the sun. Um, but, uh, you know, how could you tell whether this was really some sort of, uh, uh, you know, interstellar spacecraft or whether it was just a rock? Hard to tell. And it's particularly hard to tell because if we sort of imagine what would that, I mean, imagine that you're shown some archeological remains and it's like, this is a pile of rocks. And, but somebody says, but actually it was very carefully made by this ancient civilization that had a belief that when you make a pile of rocks like this, it will cause it to rain or something. And that was a, a crucially, very carefully and purposefully made pile of rocks. But to us now, it's like, oh, that's just a pile of rocks. So it's very hard to tell when something is sort of a, a whatever one means by intentionally made versus just a naturally created thing. And so there's a whole kind of chain of philosophical issues associated with that. But you know, if you say, was there sort of a human-like civilization that made this uh, interstellar asteroid and, um, and sort of sent it through our solar system? Well, probably not. And it's sort of the closer you say to human-like, the closer you say it, so just like modern humans, you know, it so happens it just was made by something like modern humans. Um, that's something that becomes more and more possible to, to analyze, so to speak. Let's see, okay, what, maybe one last thing. Um, the, uh, okay, there's a comment from Frederick about the uranium, uranium uh, system. Um, the, uh, yeah, it, it, it is worth saying that a critical part of that um, uh, cyber attack, I think, was the actually, actually putting a physical, you know, thumb drive into a computer. It wasn't the case that, that was, you know, I was talking before about, about um, uh, the, um, uh, the fact that lots of devices are connected to the internet because why not? I think this was a case where that wasn't the, the way that that system was broken into it. It involved physically putting, you know, something into a computer there. And, and you know, this is one of the things that happens, um, well, uh, Frederick is commenting on the electrical grid. Um, and, uh, you know, that's a complicated thing because uh, it's not so popular these days, but when everybody was trying to figure out how to, how to wire up the world, that is, you want to deliver internet to people all over the place. How do you actually get those wires laid that, um, uh, that give you the internet? I have to say it was kind of, kind of remarkable for me. I, I live in uh, not... Uh, in a somewhat rural area. And um, uh, at some point I, I had a, a, a very high-end fancy, you know, internet connection that I, I got. And it was like, uh, okay, you know, you know, this internet connection is gonna arrive. And then I see sort of a, a road nearby these trucks and the trucks are actually hanging this piece of cable. And it's like, okay, there's my internet. And, you know, it's a physical piece of cable that's being, um, being, uh, um, uh, being hung up. And um, yes, in the end, you know, cables have to be put somewhere to actually transmit the internet. By the way, with, with things like 5G, that's a wireless mechanism for getting internet to be sort of transmitted around. And so it's a little bit less of the story of putting wires on the ground and maybe if satellite communications um, become more widespread, although there's still some issues with the speed of transmission to, to and from orbit and so on. But, but in any case, the, the, the thing that um, 
you know, in the end, you've got to transmit the data somehow through wires or through fiber optics or whatever else. And you've got to lay those fiber optics somewhere, lay those wires somewhere. And there was for a period of time, oh, 10, 15 years ago, maybe, there was a big sort of competition of who has the right cables that have been laid. And so, for instance, it's like, well, there's the phone company. It's got a bunch of cables that have been laid to, to set up people's phones. Well, there's the power company. It's got a bunch of cables that have been laid to provide electric power for people. Oh, there's the water company. It's got a bunch of pipes that have been laid that go to every house. Um, and so there was sort of a competition about where should you put the wires or the fibers that would correspond to the internet and, and different, um, different groups uh, sort of bought up different capabilities to reach things. I think one of the very common things uh, if you look at the very the, the backbone of the internet, it often goes along train tracks because it was possible to kind of buy up the, the sort of the ability to, to put a piece of fiber along a train track. Um, and, uh, uh, and they sort of go long distances from here to there. So one of the things that was certainly tried, and I don't know how popular it became, was um, taking a power line, and uh, usually it's just sending, you know, sending electric power, at 60 hertz frequency, but to put to also put in some signal that would be uh, would not affect you know just plugging a random appliance into your power outlet, but would give you the ability to send data um, along those lines. I don't think that that's been widely done. I'm not sure. Um, there's a there's a quite separate thing which is smart meters, which are is kind of a way of of uh, uh, when you're um, uh, and the smart grid and so on. The question of of um, uh, what what exactly you know you're you're in your house. You're using certain electricity at certain times of day. You know what's the um, uh, uh, what's the best way to deliver electricity in the cheapest fashion to you. I, one of the things that's that's always sort of interesting when you switch something on in your house. You flick a light switch. You turn on you. You, uh, you know, you make a washing machine go, something like this, um, that any one of those things will draw a certain amount of extra power from your electrical system. And when the, you know, when the power line comes into your house, there's just a little bit of extra current that's being drawn when you switch one of these things on. And there's also a little bit of a sort of a, sometimes when the switch is switched, there's a little bit of a, glip, a, a blip in the amount of current that's drawn and so on. And so one of the things that's sort of become a popular machine learning application is can you tell from those little little blips in the, in the usage of, of power uh, for some house or, or business or whatever else, can you tell what devices are being switched on and switched off and so on? And the answer is you can to some extent. And then given that, can you optimize certain kinds of things about where you're getting power from when and, and all those kinds of things? And so all of that kind of starts in meshing kind of the um, uh, the, the the kind of the um, uh, electrical supply with things that are more internet related and and that involve kind of communication through the internet. I mean, the, the other piece is the the smart grid for electricity of the question of you've got these power stations in different places, you've got solar power in different places. Solar power is only generating power when it's daylight and you've got this thing and that thing going on. And the question is, how do you kind of match the power? How do you connect different parts of the grid together to, um, uh, to optimize kind of the, um, uh, the way that power is delivered to different places? And that's uh, obviously in, in Texas, for example, recently, there was a big disaster with that. Um, it's been one of the kind of complicated discussions that's gone on is to what extent should the electric power grid be completely connected? To what extent should it be something where uh, any place can get power from sort of anywhere else. I remember when I was growing up in England um, in the 1960s and 1970s, there was a lot of pride that the British power grid was somehow multiply redundant. I don't know if it was actually true. It was said at least. Um, and that, you know, even if you took out some pieces, it was there would still be enough connectivity that you could get power to every place. Um, and that's uh, sort of the, the, the good news about that is what I just said. The bad news is once everything is connected, if something goes horribly wrong, you can have the whole system fail. Um, and that, that happened, for example, in New York 20 years ago or something. There was an issue of that kind um, that uh, uh, was a result of, of having lots of connectivity. And I think, um, uh, but it's, it's, it's another one of these sort of 
uh, interesting trade-offs um, about how these things work. Well, the, um, uh, okay, should probably wrap up here. There was a comment here that the Wikipedia article for uh, Uma Numero, however it's pronounced, I'm probably pronouncing it slightly wrong, said that it exhibited non-gravitational acceleration. Well, interesting. I mean, it's, it's like if it had rocket engines, it could exhibit, you know, it could be sort of zooming off in some direction and exhibit acceleration that wasn't just due to the force of gravity. That could also happen if, for example, um, there was uh, a gas on its surface that got heated up or, or something on its surface, let's say ice, for example, on its surface, and uh, the light of the sun heated up that ice and caused it to turn into steam. And so you've got something where on one side of the thing it's, uh, that's facing the sun, it's got uh, essentially gas being produced that is, that is uh, uh, you know, streaming out from that side of the object, but there isn't gas streaming out from the other side of the object. So that will cause it to have some force that pushes it in that case away from the sun. So that's a, a mechanism by which you could have uh, a sort of non-gravitational acceleration without having the fun of having the sort of extraterrestrial spacecraft uh, type story go on. And then of course you have to distinguish, you say, well, actually it was, uh, you know, the extraterrestrial civilization had built it that way and they painted special stripes on it to, to make it, um, um, uh, you know, to make it work this way. And then they put camouflage on it to make it so people wouldn't think it had special stripes put on it and so on. And we're back now to a question that was asked earlier about Occam's razor. The question is, you know, is that a plausible explanation or is the most likely explanation, it's just a rock from another solar system? Or is the right explanation one that says, well, there was this civilization and it painted these things on it and it did this and did that and it camouflaged as a rock. And so now it looks like a rock to us, but it really isn't. And there's really these other things. And that's kind of a, a typical, you know, what are you going to believe Occam's razor type question. And, you know, it could be the case that that, that theory of the, the extraterrestrial civilization is the correct theory. Um, but it is our tendency to sort of think the more, the more likely scientific answer is it's just a rock from another solar system. But it's hard to know for sure. All right. Well, uh, thanks for... Um, for joining us here. Um, we, uh, uh, I wish I'd been able to get to some more of the interesting questions that were asked. Um, I will uh, look forward to continuing next week and maybe, maybe we'll try and do a few more questions with shorter answers um, next time. I always, I always find it difficult to, um, uh, to answer in a short way because a question about one thing leads to some, uh, something that I feel like, oh, people will be interested to hear about this, about something else. And pretty soon we're on this kind of random walk through through lots of different topics. But uh, uh, it's always interesting for me. I hope you guys find it interesting. And I uh, should wrap up here for now. And um, uh, see you another time.